for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is uh, Imran Tabrizi. I uh, work in uh, emergency medicine. I work in the A&E department. Basically, what happened was I um, have been doing medicine, working in the emergency department for the last 12 years. And um, myself um, and a friend of mine, Dr. Mark Tan, who can't be with us today, uh, we both worked in emergency medicine and we both share the same common um, viewpoint about medicine. And the viewpoint we have is that one of the things that we were, was that we were frustrated with the fact that a lot of patients would come into the emergency department and they would be on a whole host of medications. They would be on an anti-blood pressure pill. They would be on an anti-cholesterol pill. They would be on an anti-diabetic pill. They would be on a proton pump inhibitor. They would be on a headache pill. The list goes on. And it's something which um, is very prevalent um, in the emergency department. We get a lot of people with chronic illness. So my, I basically came, myself and Mark Tan feel that we're losing the battle against chronic medicine. I've actually seen both sides. I've seen the allopathic side, and I've seen the, uh, the other side, which is the nutritional side, and it's becoming more and more prevalent as time goes on. People are beginning to realize that um, you know, nutrition is one of the key issues to trying to live a healthy life. Um, so nowadays what happens is, is that you have people now who are uh, recognizing that. And one of the developments that has happened recently is there is something called functional medicine. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But functional medicine is something which is growing. Uh, there is, the, in the United States, in Washington State, there is the Institute of Functional Medicine. And um, last month, I attended one of the very first international forums. And our next international forum is going to be in April. So I'd urge you to go on YouTube and type in Functional Medicine International Forum. And I think it's something which, as you get involved with Kangen Water, it's going to be something that you're going to want to know more about. You see? And the reason why I say that is because how I got in, into Kangen Water was through Mark. And through discovering Kangen Water, it has taught me a huge amount about water that I never knew. In all my lectures, I always say, who is the father of medicine? Who is the father of medicine? Hippocrates? Not Socrates, no, Hippocrates. Socrates was the guy who did the 90 degree angle thing. Yeah. Hippocrates. Now, Hippocrates used to say, let thy food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be thy food. Now, I would have to say that the compass heading in medicine has changed direction drastically. We don't follow that rule anymore. We rely on medications. We rely on surgery. Now, I'm not saying that these things are bad. But what I'm saying is, is that moderation is the key. And we have to embrace this knowledge about taking responsibility for ourselves, drinking the right water which you now have, the best, and eating the right food in the right consistency and pesticide free. And that's why we call it molecular hydration of Kangen water and its application at the cellular level. Why did I choose those words? Because that is how I wish to come to common terms. How do you come to common terms? You have to take things down to the cellular and molecular level. Because people can't argue with that. It's been tried and tested. People know about atoms, protons, electrons, neutrons, at least that's what you guys are going to learn. So, so what we're going to do first of all is we'll go right into it. So apologies again. Um, what is water? What is a chemical symbol for water? H2O. So we have H2O. Now, is water H2O really? Is it just water? Is it just H2O? Is that water? Is that just what is that what water is? No. So water is a medium which contains a lot of other elements. We have sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. All of those are in the water. Okay? Now, but let's for simplicity, we'll just deal with this, H2O. 
Now, H2O can actually go to H plus plus OH minus. So this is what is called a dissociation. So water usually looks like this. You have the oxygen and you have your two hydrogens. Some of you probably have already seen this by some other prominent lectures on YouTube, including myself. But anyway, so you have H2O, which goes to H plus plus OH minus. And that is called a dissociation, and it goes back the other way. That's why the arrow is written in both ways. Now, what <coughs> we need to understand is we need to understand the difference between this, this, and this. This is half the battle. Now, every atom contains what three things? Or well, most atoms. Neutrons, protons, electrons. Right. How many neutrons does hydrogen have? You sure? Final answer? Hydrogen contains zero neutrons. Yeah, that's a trick question. You fell for it. <laughs> right. So it has zero neutrons. Okay? How many protons? One proton. And how many electrons? I'm talking about hydrogen, yeah? One electron. Now the reason why hydrogen, this is hydrogen atom, this is what we're talking about here, hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton, one electron, and therefore the proton is the positive charge, the electron is a negative charge, the positive and the negative cancel each other out, so hydrogen atom has a charge of what? Zero. Zero charge. There's no charge on hydrogen atom because the electron and the proton cancel each other out. Yes? So, what then is this creature here? What is H plus? Is that an electron or is that a proton or is it a hydrogen atom? Which one? It's a proton, right. And that's why, because it has a positive charge. So that's this. This here, hydrogen, with a plus is actually a proton. It has lost its electron. Because the electron is the thing that is on the outside. It's the cloud. The electron has been dropped, and all that's left is a proton. Now, that, ladies and gentlemen, the proton, is what determines what about the liquid. It determines the pH. Well, it determines the acidity of a liquid. So what it means is, is if you have a lot of these, what is it called? Acid or alkaline? It's an acid. So acid is if you have loads of these. If you don't have many of these, what is it? It's an alkali. Exactly. So that's the difference. Now, so that is the basic premise. This one, H2, is a hydrogen what? It's a hydrogen gas, yeah, but what is it also called? What's the title of this topic? Molecular hydrogen. molecular hydrogen. It's molecular hydrogen. That's what H2 is, molecular hydrogen. And why is it a molecule? Because it's two atoms. Two atoms make a molecule. So that's what this is, which is a gas, as you rightly said. Now, molecular hydrogen is the magic ingredient in Kangen water. Yeah, that is the secret weapon in Kangen water, H2. Now I can just pack up and go now, that's it, job done, <laughs> right? But that is it, that's the secret ingredient, H2. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we need to do is, what are the three properties of Kangen water? Alkalinization, antioxidation and? Microcluster, right. The thing we're going to deal with is alkalinization or alkalization, whichever way you want to look at it, alkalization, right? And this is determined by something called the pH. Now, what is pH? What is pH? Say again? So pH is called potential hydrogen. It's if there's a lot of protons, the number is smaller. If there is less of it, the number is higher. And the scale 
is between what and what? 1 to 14. Yeah? This means it's acidic. This means it's alkaline. Yeah? So protons, if there's a lot of it, it's acidic. So that's when you come up with pHs of 1, 2.5. Yeah? This is all in the acidic range. Then you come to our favorite, pH 9.5, which is at the other end, and even better, 11.5. Do those waters contain less protons or loads of protons? Less. less, exactly. So you got it. The next thing we're going to talk about is antioxidation. Now, in order to understand what antioxidation is, we have to understand why is it called anti? And what is it that it's doing? What's so good about antioxidation? And in order to answer that question, we have to know what a free radical is. Does anybody know what a free radical is? And it's not ISIS. <laughs> now, what is a free radical? A free radical is an atom, an ion, or a molecule that has a lot of energy. Or it becomes so energetic that it leads to damage. So what we have is we have an atom which contains, as I said before, neutrons and protons. But then you have the electrons. And what we have is we have the first shell, which contains two electrons, which is the first shell around the atom. So I want you to visualize something that looks like planets. Yeah? That's your atom. And the first shell, or the first layer, is this layer here, which has got the two electrons. So this particular one here, would be referring to helium, which is the one on the far right. Hydrogen has only got one electron. Yeah? Is this atom happy? Why not? Because it only has one electron. And electrons like to come in pairs. So this hydrogen atom will do what? It will merge with another hydrogen atom to form two electrons, and this is H2. You all got that, yeah? <laughs> all right. So this is molecular hydrogen. This is your hydrogen gas. This is the secret weapon in Kangen water, H2. When two hydrogens get together, it's because they're sharing these two electrons. You get H2, which is your hydrogen gas. All right, so we've talked about hydrogen. Let's put hydrogen up here with one electron. Now we're going to talk about fluoride, which has got two electrons in the first shell. And then in the outer shell, it's going to contain one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven electrons. Is this atom happy? No. Why not? Because it has one unpaired electron which is this one. So this fluoride atom is going to try and grab it off anybody it can get a hold of. It really wants that electron. Why do patients have high blood pressure? There's a number of reasons why they have high blood pressure. One of the causes is in the vessels, the vessels that can contain tissue, and tissue is composed of cells, and those cells get damaged. How do they get damaged? The free radicals get in and damage the inside of the cells, by doing this, by ripping electrons off other things. And by ripping electrons off, that is called an oxidation or reduction reaction? Oxidation. Oxidation, because oxidation leads to aging, damage, rust. You guys remember the apple? Yes. Yes, goes brown. So that's oxidation. So this is what it's doing. It's trying to rip electrons off to fill that up. Yes, so that's fluoride. Chloride, which is the next one down, has another shell. And that contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Has another single. Is that atom happy? No, why not? Because it has an unpaired electron. So chloride is going to do the same thing. It's going to rip electrons wherever it sees it. That's why chloride basically is causing damage to cells. And somebody decided in their right mind, there would be a good thing to go and stick in water. Yes? And who decided that? 
somebody who wanted to try and save people's lives because they felt, so you know about the story about this. This happened in London, of all places, because everything happens in London. <laughs> there was all these people getting sick. Somebody from number 22 was getting sick. Somebody from number 28 was getting sick. Somebody from 42. This guy, he looked and he said, well, why are all these people getting sick? So then he decided, he looked, and in those days, they all used to share water from the well. When you go to the center of the well, there's a well there. So he went there, took a sample of water, looked at it under a microscope, and what did he find? Bacteria. So he thought it would be a good idea. He says, I know what, we need to come up with something we can put in the water that's going to kill the bugs, but not necessarily going to kill the people. I know, we'll stick chlorine in. And that's how chlorine has been added to water. That's why we drink it. They passed it through government, and that's why we add chlorine into our waters to try and kill all the bugs. Well, what is it doing to you guys? Nobody asked that question. Yeah. Because by the time you pass away, nobody cares. Yeah? So this is what it is, chlorine. Chlorine in the water. Now, um, so chlorine is also a source of free radicals, as is fluoride. So this is a free radical. Now, how are you going to make this guy happy? You're going to have to give it something. Now this comes on to what I say in all my lectures, so some of you already know the answer to this, but in what form does the most powerful source of energy exist in? In what form does the most powerful source of energy exist in? Some people say sun, some people say light. Simpler than that. Love. Exactly, love. What is love? Love is the law power of attraction. Now what does the law power of attraction say? It says that if you give love, it has to do what? It has to come back to you. Yeah? If you give love, it has to come back to you. It's not a question of when, it's not a question of if. But what you must, must, must not do is expect. Don't expect. You give it freely. Why is that important? Because now we come on to the secret weapon in Kangen, which is molecular hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen contains two electrons, which they share. Yes? Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is your antioxidant. This splits apart and becomes two hydrogen atoms. And why are they hydrogen atoms and not protons? Because they contain their electrons. Now can you see now that if you introduce this to this, it's going to come and insert itself here and shut this up. Yeah. So by donating that electron and uniting with chloride, it's an antioxidant. It's neutralized the free radical. It's prevented the free radical from causing a catastrophe by ripping electrons off everybody else. Can you see the beauty in that? That's what molecular hydrogen is doing. It splits apart. You have all those, so all of those little bubbles that you see in the water, those things are going to get inside of you. And when they get inside of you, they're going to neutralize the free radicals inside your body, which you expose yourself to day by day. Now, the other one, this is chloride. Fluoride is the one above. Has anybody ever heard anything good about fluoride, apart from the fact that it seals all the uh, stuff in your teeth? No? So fluoride, what does it do? Yeah, it does. But the other thing it does is, they did some studies on about 100 cadavers. Um, and what happened was, is they looked at these cadavers, they looked at the brains of these cadavers. And what they discovered was, was where the pineal gland is in the brain, they found that it was corroded. It was completely calcified. And this pineal gland, how it got like that was because of a buildup of fluoride. The fluoride, for some reason, uh, or accumulates in that particular area. And everybody knows that the pineal gland is what's known as the third eye. It's your ability to be able to have insight. It's 
is determined by that gland, the pineal gland in the brain. So you can imagine fluoride causing that problem. And one of the problems we have now is that a lot of water has fluoride in. As a matter of fact, there are some places where it is actually legislation to put fluoride in the water. And in England, we have places where we have hotspots where they actually, by law, have to put fluoride in the water. Thankfully, it's not London, where I live. It's up north. Hey, hey, hey. So, fluoride. So fluoride can actually get deposited in the pineal gland. Now, the other thing that fluoride is, they did another study where they found that the fluoride in the water, most of the people living in that area, they had very low IQs. And they associate that with fluoride. So fluoride is, doesn't have good press when it comes to those kind of things, but clearly it's very good for your teeth. But hey, good teeth, no brain? I don't know. <laughs> you work it out. But anyway, so fluoride and chloride. So hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, is going to neutralize those things, yes? And that's basically how you get the uh, free radicals. That's the antioxidants. That's the antioxidant story. Now, the other thing I want to clear up about the antioxidant story is this thing about the ORP. Now, what does ORP stand for? Oxidative reduction potential, right, okay. Now, okay, ORP is actually measuring a ratio. Now, what is the ratio? The ratio is between this product, or this particular species, and this. Does anybody know how you get from this to this? You should know now, because we talked about it. This is a what? What is this, a proton or electron, what is it? It's a proton, right. What do I have to add to this to make this? What do I have to add to this to make this? An electron, right. So if I add one electron, I get this. So how do I go from this to this? You add another one which has a proton and an electron, and you get that. So if you add two electrons and one proton, you get this. That's the difference. Now, the ORP, when it becomes negative, what that means is, is that there is a lot of this. And less of this. Yeah? So do you see now, when you get your pH 9.5, is there a lot of protons or not much? <coughs> not much. Not much. When you get your pH 9.5, are there a lot of H2 hydrogen gas bubbles in it or not? So you have a lot of this and little of this, so therefore you have a negative ORP. Yes? You get a negative ORP. If you have a positive ORP, it's the other way around. It means you've got more protons and less H2. So the other thing I'd like to do is to clear up this notion about how the electrolysis works. Electrolysis works through a system where you have a positive and a negative. The is what we're going to throw into this system. So you have your Kangen machine, you have your seven electrodes all lined up. You have the positive charge on this side, negative charge on that side. So what it means is, is that all of those ions are going to separate out. So you've got H plus and OH minus. So really, all of the OH minuses should go down the positive one. Because this attracts all the OH minuses. Because this is the positive electrode. But I noticed that in some diagrams it's flipped around the other way. But anyway, at the end of the day, basically what you have is you have a system where you're separating the water out into acidic water and alkaline water. So you're going to have all the ones with OH minuses, which hardly have any of protons, which is going to produce your 9.5 pH. And then on the other electrode, you're going to have all your protons, yes? And this is going to produce your acid, yeah? 9.5 and this side should be 4.5, because they both add up to 14, yeah? So you have the acid on this side, so this is the lower spout, and this one is the upper spout. Theoretically, that's how should this work. Now, now, the last thing we've got to talk about is microcluster. Yes? 
cluster. Microcluster is basically a way of trying to describe the property that the water has in being able to penetrate and get into places where you wouldn't ordinarily expect it to. Yes? Now, how does it do it? Nobody really understands. If you go up to a scientist and say to him, this water is very, very small and this water is very, very big, he's going to tell you where to go. Yeah? <laughs> because there is simply no way of quantifying how you know, you can, I mean, you get all these people who bring these big beads and small beads and, you know, they've got 50,000 beads in a beaker and 10,000 in the other one. They say, oh, this one's smaller and this one's bigger. Very, very good idea of explaining it. But what it actually does, it uses a very careful sort of way of basically vibrations, I think is what it is. It looks at the vibrations of the, of the actual uh, atoms and its ability to penetrate. But I think the key thing is active hydrogen. What we now need to do is we now need to look, so we've talked about molecular hydrogen. Now we're going to talk about, talk about molecular hydrogen. Now we're going to talk about the cellular aspect. Now, this is where we go back to, we've studied chemistry, now we're going to do some biology. So, we've got the cell. What is the most important part of a cell? Say again? The nucleus? The membrane, yeah. It's who you let in and who you let out. It's the bouncers at the door. That is very important. And this is made of a lipid bilayer. Now, what is a lipid bilayer? A lipid bilayer is basically you have fats and you have proteins. Now, what is the purpose of a cell? What does a cell do? What does a cell do? Yeah, it duplicates. But the other thing it does, it's a factory. It's a factory for making things. How do we know that? Because in here you've got the genetic code. Then you have, this is DNA. Then on the outside of the cell you have these wonderful things here, which are called what? Mitochondria. Yeah, and this is the energy, this is the energy producing uh, cells. Or basically what it is, is they're organelles which are in the cell, which produce energy. And the currency of energy in the body is known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's the energy. If you've got enough of those, that's how you're able to walk around, move around. Yes, ATP. So these mitochondria produce ATP. And this here is your nucleus. So what you have is you have your DNA, and then you have the messenger RNA which comes out, and then you have these things called Golgi apparatus. And this goes here and it produces proteins. It takes amino acids and it joins it together and then it ships that protein out of the cell. That's basically what it is. Yes? So it's like a sort of power plant. It's, like a, it's almost like a car manufacturing factory. Yeah? It's a factory producing cars and the cars get shipped out. That's what the cell is. It's producing all these wonderful proteins which go and circulate around. Now, what are the four side effects of Kangen water? Right, so the first side effect is you get a headache. Yeah? People who are not used to drinking Kangen, first thing that they get, not everybody, first thing that they get is they get a headache. Usually lasts maybe the evening and then it goes off. Now why do they get a headache? We are told that it's called healing crisis, which is true. Because what it is, is that in your body you have water. And we'll come on to that in a second because I need to explain to you how that works. But essentially your cells are not used to it. It's not used to that degree of alkalinity. Somebody in their right mind came up with this idea that you should all drink tap water, which has a pH of 7. And we've been doing that ever since. Yes? Yeah. Now, our body is used to that. Suddenly, we get 9.5 pH thrown into the system. You start drinking it, and it gets into the bud. And we know that it has this microcluster capabilities. It can penetrate every single cell. As a matter of fact, as soon as that water touches your lips, it's getting absorbed straight into the system. It goes through the cell, into the blood, up in, across the blood-brain barrier, into the brain, into the cell of the brain, yes? And then your brain then says, what the hell is happening here? All this PAR, it's completely overloaded. And it starts firing off all of these signals and you get a headache. And then what happens is it starts to acclimatize, everything gets back to normal, and then your body gets used to it. So that's the first side effect, yes? The second side effect is what? You go to the toilet. You end up peeing more, yes? Because obviously, if all this fluid is getting into the system, it's got to come out sometime. 
And this is why half of you will end up going to the toilet halfway through this. Uh, if, that's if you've been drinking all day. But anyway, so that's the second side effect. The third side effect is you start to sleep better. Now, why do you sleep better? Because inside the brain, you're producing something called melatonin. When the melatonin levels go up, you sleep better. And the last side effect is your energy levels start to go skyrocketing through the day. These are usually slightly later side effects. And the serotonin level goes up because your body's producing more serotonin. Now, why is it doing that? Why is it producing more? This is a question you're going to get asked. Why? Well, this is your cell. Inside this cell, you have liquid, you have this, you have all of these organelles. Think about it like a car factory plant. If I want to increase productivity in a car plant, what do I need to do? You've got to have better facilities. You've got to have more workers. You've got to make sure you feed the workers. You don't want workers who end up collapsing on the floor and you kick them out. Yeah? You need to make sure that they have the proper working environment. You need to make sure you have proper materials so they can build the car. You need to make sure that you have enough funding. Yeah? All of these things become important. So exactly the same thing is happening here. What you need is you need all of these cells to have all of the uh, things to, so that it can produce. So you need proteins, you need nutrition, and the other two things you need is temperature and pH. Yeah? So for example, if you're working in a power plant or working in a back, uh, car factory plant, if you reduce the temperature in the room to minus 20 degrees, are those workers going to work effectively? No. no. So you're going to make sure that, and if you heat it up too high and it gets really boiling hot, are they going to work effectively? No. no. So you've got to make sure they have air conditioning. So those peak workers can work properly. So temperature is important. Yeah? The other thing that's important is pH. Yeah? So if you have the optimum pH in this cell, it's going to produce more. So what I'm saying is, is that those people who do not sleep properly, yes, they probably aren't producing enough melatonin. And it's possible that because their pH environment is too high, it should be slightly lower. And how are we going to achieve a slightly lower pH? By drinking Kangen 9.5. Because you're going to optimize the pH in the cell so that it can do the job that it was meant to do, which is to produce those proteins and those me uh, melatonin in the cells and so that you can sleep properly, serotonin, so that you have high energy when you're you know, working through the day during the day. So this is what the cellular environment. So it's important you understand this because that's how you're going to understand how those side effects come into play. Yeah. So, the next thing we need to talk about is, uh, for example, these conditions. So you have things like diabetes, you have high blood pressure, we had somebody who had SLE, we have cancer, all of these conditions. Now, I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but as I said before, if we can go down to the molecular and cellular level, we might, you might be able to answer those questions for yourself. We've already discovered that in order for a cell to work properly, it has to have the optimum environment to do it in. So we've established that the temperature is important. pH is important. Now, you've all heard of a guy called Otto Heinrich Warburg, yes? And what did he say about cancer cells? Acidic environment and? Lack of oxygen, exactly. So, in order to try to counteract that, you want to try and provide an environment which is alkaline and has antioxidant properties or oxidation. The, what you're trying to do essentially is you're trying to produce a cellular environment which contains less protons. Now this comes on to what's known as the dilutional effect. And to explain the dilutional effect, we have to go to the next diagram, which is to understand how much water there is in a 70 kilogram male. We have a 70 kilogram male. How many liters of water inside a 70 kilogram male? So the answer is 45. 45 liters of water in a 70 kilogram male. Now the guy who came up with 3.5 is probably getting mixed up with the volume of blood in the body. And how much volume of blood is there in the body? How many pints? 
eight pints or five liters. Yeah? So five liters of liquid is in blood. We've got five liters of blood. Where's the other 40? No, no, no. 40 plus five makes 45, yeah? Have I not written it big enough? So 45 liters of water, five liters in the blood. Where's the other 40? Right, so you've got 25 in the intracellular space. How many cells are there in the body? Start counting. I want an answer by this evening. Okay. So there's between 37 and 70 trillion cells in the body. If you take every single one of those cells and take all the liquid out of all of them, yes, you get about 25 liters in total. So if you have 25 liters intracellular, where's the rest? Extracellular. Yeah. Remember I drew that diagram of the cell? Yeah? You've got liquid in the cell, and you've got liquid outside the cell. Inside the cell, 25, outside 15. So that's how the distribution of water is in the body. You drink your Kangen water, your bottle. Can you see how the volume is going to separate? How much of that is going to be intracellular? Is it going to be more or less than in the blood? More of it is going to go to the cells. Yeah? Because 25 liters is intracellular. Yeah? So if you divide this up in proportions, the majority of the water is going to go intracellular. So some of it is going to be extracellular, and the l l least is going to be in the blood. Yeah? That's how the water is going to distribute, because we also know that this particular Kangen water has what other property? Microcluster. So it means that it can get through all of those barriers. Remember, <coughs> the fluid in the blood is contained within a closed circuit of arteries, veins, capillaries, venules, and the chamber of the heart. That's where all the volume of blood is. Yeah? So that's one, that's one closed circuit. So you're going to get water getting into that. Then you've got water in the cells, which are surrounded by a cellular membrane. And then you've got fluid outside the cells, which are within a network of uh, cells, which are encasing that extracellular space. So straight away, you can see you have three different compartments. You've got the fluid compartment in the blood, you've got fluid compartment in the cell, and you've got fluid compartment in the extracellular space. This water has to try to penetrate all of that. And as we know, Kangen water has the capability of doing that. So it's going to separate out like that. Can you see now why the majority of that water is going to get into the intracellular space? That's why in two hours' time, or one and a half, you're all going to end up in the toilet. Because it all has to come back out. Now, if you have a system like that, can you see why detoxification is going to be very important? Because if that water can penetrate the intracell, that water can get into the cell and it can then come out, essentially you have a system, you have the best transportation system possible at your disposal by drinking this water. Because this water is going to get into the system, it's going to take out all of the carbon dioxide and all of the, di all the various different excretants. Yes? You've seen the diagram where Dr. Michaels explains about how the cell contracts and, and expands, and then by contracting and expanding, it's releasing some of those uh, toxins. And you've got nutrients going in. So the water gets in, it changes the pH environment within the cell. So now we're covering, Peter, uh, sorry, we're covering uh, Otto Heinrich Warburg's uh, uh, point, which is that you're trying to alkalinize the inside. Now, what you're actually doing is you're going to be reducing the pH. So the more and more of this Kangen water that you drink day by day, I mean, how much water are you going to drink in a day? It varies. The, 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 the allopathic guideline is men should be drinking at least 2.5 liters of water a day, and women should be drinking 2 liters a day. But that's a guesstimate. What you should actually do is take your volume in kilograms, multiply it by 50. So if you're 50 kilograms and you multiply by 50, you should be drinking at least 2.5 liters of water a day. Yeah. If you're 100 kilos, Multiply that by, 20, by 50, you should be drinking about 5 liters a day, or about a gallon. American gallon, which is just under 5, so about five, 5 liters. But 
If you have 45 liters of water in your body, how long is it going to take before you completely replace all that water? If you're drinking five liters a day. Take about nine days. Yeah? If you're drinking half of that, it'll take you about two weeks. Well, 18 days. Well, about maybe coming up to three weeks before you actually replace all of that water. Yeah? So this is essentially what you're trying to aim for, to try and get all of that water in and detoxify the body. So after three weeks of drinking Kangen water at two liters a day, you can rest assured that what you're doing is you're replacing all of that. You're detoxifying the body. So that's one of the other main benefits. So can you see now, as we go through this, explaining at the cellular and molecular level, we've already covered loads of properties here. One property we've already talked about, detoxification. Another property we've talked about is trying to uh, get the pH to be slightly lower and create an environment in which cancer cells cannot grow. Because Otto Heinrich Warburg said that if you can get the pH... Now, before we talk about what Otto Heinrich Warburg said, what's the normal pH of blood? So the pH of blood is normally between 7.35 and 7.45. Anything outside of that range, the body goes into shock. What you're actually trying to do is you're trying to alkalinize the cells in the body. Yeah? That's what you're trying to aim to do. But that also involves blood, because blood contains cells. So for example, we've already established that the normal blood pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. I have seen patients come into the a &E department with pHs of 6.9. And 6.9 is very, very ill. These patients are patients who have what's known as uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. So basically what it means is they've got a lot of acid in their body. Yes? So by having a lot of acid in their body, you need to try to reduce it. And this is why the body goes into shock. Yeah? So what happens is those patients who have diabetic ketoacidosis, they're breathing very high. They're like that. They're hyperventilating because they're blowing off CO2, carbon dioxide, to try and get their body to reduce the acidity. So this is what the body, how the body works. So this system here is how the body controls that. So the blood pH is trying to maintain within this 7.35 to 7.45. Yeah? And anything outside of that is going to basically uh, not be compatible with life. So what Otto Heinrich Warburg said was, is that if you can get a pH of 7.41 or above, cancer cells cannot grow. Can you see now why, by drinking Kangen 9.5 or 11.5, that that might help to sorry, would help to increase the pH of the cells? Yeah. Now it's not going to happen where you just drink the water and suddenly all the cells then become 11.5. It doesn't work like that because it's called a dilution effect. I always equate this to taking a drop of my blood. If I take a drop of my blood and drop it in the ocean, does the ocean go red? It doesn't, but it goes slightly red. What degree of redness? We don't know. It's very, very, very minute. It's the same with 11.5 pH. You add that to the water, you add that to the body, it's going to increase the pH only very slightly. But it may just be slight enough to push that pH above 7.41 and create an environment in all the cells in the body to be at a level where cancer cells cannot grow. So do you see now why that pH is important? Yes? Excellent. So that's about the blood story. We've talked about Otto Heinrich Warburg, about trying to increase the pH, 11.5. Um, I think that's it. I think I've covered it all. Thank you very much.